Well, we are in Exodus chapter 8 in our Bibles, if you want to turn there, Exodus chapter 8. And we are working through a series I've titled, Leaving the Darkness. Leaving the Darkness as we explore the Exodus, Moses leading the people out of Egypt into the Promised Land, uh, through the Red Sea, really out of slavery into freedom, out of darkness into light, out of the world into the Promised Land, into the Kingdom. Um, really out of the hands of the devil, of Satan, the enemy, and into the hands of Christ, entering into Christ. And the title of the message today, if you're taking notes, is The Finger of God. The Finger of God, it actually shows up in our text today, of all texts, we're only covering four verses today, but this is sermon number 17 through the book of Exodus, and it is short, but there's a lot sitting in there. Heard of a story, maybe heard of this one too. Two friends met one day after many years. One attended college, and that was very successful. And the other had not attended college and had not, never had much ambition. But the successful one said, how has everything been going with you? He said, one day, I opened the Bible at random, and I dropped my finger on a word, and it was oil. So I invested in oil, and boy, did the oil wells gush. Then the other day, I dropped my finger on another word, and it was gold. So I invested in gold, and those mines really produced, and now I'm rich as a Rockefeller. The successful friend was so impressed that he rushed into his hotel. He grabbed the Gideon Bible hiding there in the drawer, and he flipped it open, and his finger dropped on a page, and he opened his eyes, and his finger rested on the words, chapter 11. <laughs> Come on. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. You'll get it on the way out. <laughs> C.S. Lewis said, history is a story written by the finger of God. We know the Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God. But have you ever really traced the finger of God through the story of your life? Have you ever sat down and reflected? Sometimes when tragedy happens... All of a sudden, time freezes for us, and then all of a sudden, we'll reflect back on life, and we'll start to see where God's finger has been working, what he's been up to. I never thought about this really at all when I was young. I never thought about it at all. But then as I grew older, and even now, I, I reflect back on this a lot. These, these major moments in life, good or bad, the finger of God showing up in my life and saying something to me. And either everything is happening by coincidence, just happening and doesn't really matter, has no meaning or purpose in the universe. We're all just these ants floating on a ball in space and doesn't matter really what happens. Or everything is happening according to God's will and story. And God is trying to get your attention trying to get your attention, America. Trying to get your attention, church. Either everything is just happening or it's not just happening. Is he actually the author and finisher of our faith? The author and finisher of our faith? These are questions that I, of course, think about a lot especially as I'm working through life. And life doesn't always go as planned. And then other times I feel like I hit the lotto. You know what I'm talking about? Just amazing things happen and show up in life. And you're like, gosh, you're so good. And it changes life forever in an amazing way. I want to analyze this today. I want to look at it as we see the finger of God show up in our text and our story here in the Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 8 in our Bibles. Can we stand for the reading of God's word? We always stand for the reading of God's word to pay honor to him and remember whose word we are reading. Not my words, definitely not my text, belongs to God. So we pay honor to him, remember his words. And we also take to heart and remember that it is his word speaking to us, our lives, directly to our hearts, into our ears, into our eyes. We're going to read verses 16 to 19 in our Bibles of chapter 8. It says this, Then Yahweh said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, 
that it may become gnats through all the land of Egypt, and they did so. And Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats through all the land of Egypt. Then the magicians did the same with their secret arts in order to bring forth gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. And the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened with strength, and he did not listen to them as Yahweh had spoken. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we thank you for your story. And God, we ask that as we open your text today and we analyze it, that you would reveal to us what you were up to. How your finger was at work. The magicians, the non-believers could see it. God, we pray that we would be able to see it in our lives in real time and identify that in our lives and it would cause real change, real transformation. Lord, I pray for every heart, Lord, every person, every story here today that you would continue your work in them and that you would open their eyes to see your fingerprints, what you're up to in their life, that they would identify it. They would cling to you. They would walk with you through life. Bless us as we study your word now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Our last time together, we saw God tell Moses and Aaron, remember, to strike the land so that the Nile would bring forth frogs beyond number. Remember? Frogs came and covered the land, big and small, and they were everywhere in their cabinets, in their bowls, in their ovens, in their bathrooms, in their beds. They were loud, and they were even upon every single person, including Pharaoh. Not even Pharaoh could get away from these frogs that took over the land. Millions of them, they came out of the Nile. And God was attacking and striking down the, their fertility god, Hekek. Remember, we saw the frog god of the Egyptians that they worshipped, believing that this frog god dwelt in the Nile and brought forth fertility to their land and to their wives or to their females. And in the last month, when the child was going to be born, they would wear a necklace of a frog around their neck, worshiping that God, trusting they would have a good delivery. God went and attacked that God of fertility, saying, no, no, I am the giver and taker of life. I am the one who sustains the child in the womb. It is me. And he sent frogs upon their whole land, millions of them, so much that they were sick of these frogs, said, get them out of here. And remember, eventually overwhelmed by this, Moses goes to Pharaoh and asks him, when do you want the frogs gone? And he says, tomorrow. Not right now, tomorrow. And we looked at that, the word of tomorrow in our own lives. This is where our story picks up. We will see the third of ten plagues come upon Egypt. And Yahweh is the one tearing down the gods of Pharaoh and Egypt one by one through these plagues. Remember, every plague display is an attack on the gods that they worshipped in their society. And I wonder what plague God would send upon us. I don't know. We worship a lot of different things here in America. Maybe God would amplify and multiply those things so much in our lives it would make us sick of them. Let's jump back a couple of verses to get some context of what's happening in the text before us. Look at verse 14 and 15 in your Bibles. It says, so they piled them, frogs, in heaps, and the land became foul. So sounds like Moses said, all right, the frogs are going to be gone, and they all just die everywhere. And they had to start shoveling them up, and they were piling them in heaps. Heaps is a word that I hear, I hear Australians and New Zealanders say that, the Kiwis say, the Aussies, heaps. I, I remember hearing this first time, heaps. I'm like, what would you say? Heaps. They had heaps of frogs piled up and the land became foul. Then Pharaoh saw that there was relief for a moment and he then hardened his heart with firmness and he did not listen to them as Yahweh had spoken. Then Yahweh said to Moses, 
say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth that it may become gnats throughout all the land of Egypt. So notice Yahweh tells Moses to have Aaron bring the third plague upon Egypt without having any conversation uh, before so. Just like in the last two plagues, Moses approaches Pharaoh, they have a conversation, and then boom, he tells them what's going to happen, and the plague shows up on the land. But in this scenario, notice, no conversation with Pharaoh. And I wonder if it is because after the frogs were dead, verse 15 says Pharaoh saw relief. Because he essentially lied to Moses. He said he was going to let the people go. He lies to Moses, lies to God. And as soon as he saw relief, as soon as he saw God let up, he was like, I'm not letting the people go. And so God says, all right, then no conversation. Release the gnats. Release the hounds. Right? And we talked about this a little bit last week and how when we have relief in our life, oftentimes we beg God to save, we beg God to show up, and as soon as there's relief, we just go right back to our sin. But oh man, when we get crushed, when we get overwhelmed, wow, we're on our face for a little while now, aren't we? 34 days, and then right back to our sin. So no more talking, just punishment. We actually see this in plague three, six, and nine, I believe. No conversation, just the plague shows up. God's like, he's hard in his heart again. Release the gnats. The text will reveal to us that this plague will get the attention of a group who hasn't declared it was God doing this yet. God was not surprised that it didn't get Pharaoh's attention. He told Moses what was going to happen. Pharaoh's not going to listen to you like 10 times over. And then finally, he will listen to you. But it's going to build the story. It's going to build the drama. And you're going to see God's great glory displayed in the end. We talked about this before. That's not very much fun if Moses just walks up to Pharaoh, says it, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, okay. And the story's over. Uh, 10 no's and all these plagues. And then finally the buildup, and he declared, fine, get him out of here. And then the Red Sea, the story is mapped out greatly, perfectly to declare the glory of God. But again, Pharaoh was not interested, and he was not listening. But we will see there is a group in this text today before us who seems to take notice of what God is up to. So God tells Moses and Aaron to stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth that it may become gnats through all the land of Egypt. Strike the dust of the earth with your staff. Why the dust of the earth? Well, as we have been talking about, it was an attack against their god, Geb, G-E-B, Geb, the earth god, the god of whom they believe was the God of the dust, the God of earth. And we have some pictures of him to show now. Geb was the Egyptian God of the earth. He could also be considered, they called him the father of snakes. It was believed in ancient Egypt that Geb's laughter created earthquakes and that he allowed crops to grow. And they would worship this God and um, here are a couple actual images that they have, and then a couple illustrated. <clears throat> a bird sits on his head, and he is pictured with the god of the sky, a female. And they illustrated this, that he had relationship with the god of the sky. But it's very interesting that this is the God of the earth for the Egyptians, and many of them called him the father of snakes. We all know who is the true God of the earth. Yahweh. He is the God of the ground. The first mention of this word, strike the dust, strike the dust, this word dust, the first mention of this word, strike the dust of the earth, is found in Genesis 2-7. Same word, same Hebrew word, first mention of it is here, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground 
and breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. You know what the second mention of dust Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, second mention of the word dust in the Bible. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done all of this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Snake, serpent, the father of snakes, the earth. Again, all of these pictures, all of these parallels shout to the spiritual world. Again, God is having a Super Bowl of the gods here right in the middle of Pharaoh's palace. And the spiritual world is watching on. And these parallels are for sure known by them. And God is now going to strike the dust. He's going to strike the the, the ground and declare to the world that he is God. Psalm 103, verse 14 is the same word dust that we know very well. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. Do you know your frame? We think we're magnificent, don't we? We think we're great, huh? We think we're powerful. We think we're famous and wealthy and rich and influential. God says, I remember who you are. You're but dust. And I formed you from the ground. I like to call us dirt bags. You know what I mean? Come on. Come on. Dad jokes. Let's go. (laughs) Geb, the god of earth, the god of dust, father of the snakes, can't help but make the jump to the connection of the father of lies, that father of snakes, father of lies, Satan, the demon behind that god. The demon that is being worshipped behind that statue, behind these gods of our society, they're still alive today. They're still running around in different form. People worship the earth. Mother Earth. Are you kidding me? The Bible tells us clearly in Psalm 24.1, we know it, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it. The world and all its people belong to him. It's always belonged to him. It belongs to no one else. Never forget that everything in the earth is the Lord's. And just because the enemy tries to borrow it and drag it into the mud doesn't mean it doesn't belong to the Lord. We've been talking about this theme, but I really want to ring on it week after week because church, we must be a people who don't just condemn the things that the world is doing. Yes, we will do that. But we have to go and take what they have taken from God and take it back to him and redeem it for his glory. What the world is doing with the things that belong to God, they take literally everything and turn it into worship of other gods and sinful, wicked things. And all we must do is take that thing back And realize why God made it and what its purpose is for and do it unto his glory. Redeem all things. Including like music, for instance. We were just at John Williams concert this last week. It was fantastic. And it's just amazing to watch all of this go down. The music is so powerful. Even written for these movies that, that have impacted our lives. We say we, 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 we take this in, and I can't help but worship, man. Because I know where these notes came from. Like, I know who made all these instruments. And yeah, it may be used to exalt this film or, or be written to move people in, in emotion in a certain way. But nevertheless, I'm redeeming it in my own mind. I'm like, the, all of these notes belong to God. And God made John Williams and put that brilliance in his own mind to be able to craft this kind of stuff and pull it together. And I love redeeming it all back for his glory. I don't know what you see in the society that the enemy has taken and drug into the mud and caused it to be sinful and destructive and just hurt people, or it's just been taken from God and is being used to prop up all kinds of other things. Let us take it all back and declare it for God's glory. 
It, I mean, it would even be amazing at, at the end of it all, even if it was written for the movies and it was written to make you feel good and it was written to move you and do all these things. And at the end of the con, they stand up and say, this was all written unto the glory of God. Because again, it takes my craft. It takes what I'm doing. And even though I'm doing it to entertain and to bless and to help other people and do all these kinds of things, at the end of the day, the way in which I see it, my perspective in which I'm doing it really changes everything now, does it? So let me ask you, what are you doing each day and why are you doing it and what is its ultimate purpose for? You have to ask these questions. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world belongs to him. The people belong to him. And just because somebody's taken something and made it satanic or made it dark or made it sinful, I'm telling you, whatever that industry is, whatever that thing is, you can take it all back and start to use it for God's glory to redeem and bless and help people. Amen? It's our job to take everything back. The earth is the Lord's, not Geb's. Sorry, Geb. The dust belongs to the Lord. It's not yours. Egyptians, you're, you're praising the wrong God. That, that is not, it doesn't come from Geb. That's a demon. You're worshiping. He made us from the dust of the ground, and so guess what? He can strike the dust and bring forth gnats, bugs, like you can't even number, you can't even imagine. Look at verse 17, and they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff, and he struck the, the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast, and the dust of the earth became gnats throughout all the land of Egypt. So Aaron takes out his staff, and he hits the ground, and it becomes gnats, lice, or mosquitoes. Your translations, it comes forth in these three different small bugs. We know they're very small. We know they probably bit. It's translated different ways, but the idea is that these very small creatures were biting humans and animals in the land. They were inflicting. It's not just like, uh, get that out of my ear, you know? It's a, the, you know, the cow moving his ear, you know? It's just, this is not it. We know annoying and painful mosquitoes, gnats, and lice can be, oh man, mosquitoes have taken over the land of LA. What in the world's happening? Right? Those little striped creatures, oh, I smash them every chance I get. I've become so good, I can catch them with chopsticks. No, I'm just kidding. I can't. But I can s slap them with my hands, and, I, and it's an art form, you know. I take great pride in doing this. Mm -hmm. But every speck of dust, the text says, probably didn't turn into a bug, though it says the dust of the land turned into gnats. Not every single grain of dust, same as, and your descendants will be as many as the sand in the seashore, as many as the stars in the sky. It's not actual number. It is a picture that they will be innumerable. You can't count them. Um, and so it's applying that the amount was innumerable and it took over everything. And I'm saying not like, you know, you got five mosquitoes in your house. We're talking hundreds. You go out in the middle of the Amazon, you know what's going, you know what we're talking about here. You go out in the middle of a jungle into a forest. Uh, people put up these nets to try to get away from these creatures when they're camping out in the middle of nowhere and they just won't stop. Yeah, they, they, these Egyptians, they brought out the citronella candles. They brought the offspray. They got the 100% DEET, and it still wasn't working. Let's show the swarm picture. I wanted you to get the, get the full picture here. You know what I'm talking about. Like swarms, maybe you've seen the gnats uh, back east or in the south that can show up. There's lots of different cultures that experience locusts and swarms of bees and all kinds of swarms that can show up. But why don't you get the picture of the black swarm coming through the sky, kind of starting to darken the sky away. What is that? Literally just lift from the ground. When he hits the ground, the dust turns into bugs. What a wild visual. Would God send gnats into your life to bug you? Come on, dad joke. Yes. 
he would. I was working on a chicken coop these last two weeks. We got seven chickens. Not joking. Fresh eggs coming your way. And when I'm, I get myself into these projects, I like doing lots of projects. I work my hands a ton. I used to build houses before I became a pastor. And I like working with my hands. I enjoy the craft of working on machines and building things and creating. And I really love when it goes smooth. You know, Jesus was a carpenter, and I always picture that everything just went smooth for him, you know? The nail just went in perfectly, and, you know, just, all, just everything worked out. For me, not so much. And as I'm in the project, oftentimes, I'll just start getting frustrated. And I'll, even, I'll start having a conversation with the Lord. I'm just like, why? Why? You know this could go easy, because it does sometimes. But sometimes he's just trying to lengthen my patience. Would God send a gnat into your life to bug you? Oh, yeah. I found that the bugging in my life is what stretches me, challenges me, and grows me. You know, kids are an amazing joy to your life, no doubt, but they will stretch your patience. And it's an amazing equation when you think about it because they produce such maximum joy. But then they can challenge you with such extreme frustration that you, you literally can feel your patience expand. Like, God, please, please help me stay self-controlled and have some patience right now. And I remember my pop when I was young. My papa, we go fishing. I'd be sitting there at the side of this creek and I, uh, we'd be fishing, and I, this is me. And this is my pop. Josh, leave it in the water. Leave it in the water. Have some patience. You're not going to catch anything. I can hear him over and over. Josh, leave it in the water. As a boy, I had no clue what he was talking about. Patience? Would God send gnats into your life to bug you? Yeah. What's bugging you today? Hmm. Is he trying to get your attention? No, it's just a gnat. It's a mosquito. Interesting, because it reveals your sin, doesn't it? Wow, the little gnat can actually reveal your sin very quickly. He sends a bug to bug you. And before you know it, your sin is revealed. You're frustrated. You're overwhelmed. Would God do this? Of course he would. Look at verse 18. Then the magicians did the same with their secret arts in order to bring forth gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. The magicians tried to bring forth magic. Like Moses and Aaron by the hand of Yahweh, and they could not do it this time. And I love it that it says that they could not do it. It's no surprise to us, but we must remember the enemy, the devil, Satan, and his goons cannot do what God does. Did you know that? Satan and the devil, his demons, and even his followers cannot do what God does. And I got to keep ringing this true in this day and age. Because, man, do we give a lot of credit to the evil in this world. They cannot do what God does. Not even close. They literally have to throw up their hands. We must remember this. Satan and his demons try to convince the world that they are the same as God, but they aren't even close. Like the distance of greatness is God standing holding the universe in his hands. And the devil is an ant on the earth. This is the distance between the greatness of God and this fallen angel that he created named Lucifer. Don't forget that. Because again, we get so riled up over what's happening in our earth and we get, get in fear and we get anxious and we get stressed out. Oh no, the evils of the world are taking over. No, they're not. 
They can't even make the gnats go away. Sure, they do little tricks, and they do things that affect our lives. But you have to understand that God is in control. All you have to do is go back to Job chapter 1 and watch the conversation with God and Satan. Literally, Satan's got to ask God, is it okay if I touch your servant Job? Well, let me think about it. He is faithful. And have you considered my servant Job? All he's done? Well, that's because you just protect him. Now he'll still worship me. Okay, I'll let you touch my guy. Remember, God has only allowed his people to go into slavery 400 years. God allowed it, but he could have said, nope, not happening, and it would have never happened. And God is the one who will set his people free in the moment when he wants to. He will snap his fingers. He will bring the tenth plague, and the Red Sea will part, and they will go into the wilderness, and they will enter the promised land as he declares. And the same thing can happen in this earth anytime he wants to. Game over. Here's my throne. We're going to heaven. It's done. Right? He can do whatever he wants. We have to remember this. Matthew 9, 26, but Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. The context is this, in Matthew 19, 23, Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible, and rich, a rich person can and will enter the kingdom of heaven. With God, it's possible. All things are possible. Genesis 18, 14 says, is anything too difficult for the Lord? And here's the context, that about at the appointed time, I will return to you in about a year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son you know how old she was? 90. 100 years old, these people. Amazing. Nothing is impossible with God. And I mean nothing. What do you think is impossible? What do you think God can't do? What do you think is out of his reach? Who do you think is out of his reach? What are you worried about? Why are you stressed? You see, it's the same for me. I don't get it. I preach this stuff. I know it well. And over and over and over again, my heart wants to go there. Lord, are you in this? You, you know what you're doing? This nail won't go into the chicken coop. <laughs> Do you know what you're doing? Verse 19, and the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened with strength and he did not listen to them as Yahweh had spoken. The magicians, they're standing there with Pharaoh. They'd look at him and say, we can't do this. Do you see all these trillions of mosquitoes? This is the finger of God. Non-believers are saying this to another non-believer. This is the finger of God, man. I've seen a lot of crazy stuff, but I'm telling you, this is the finger of God, Pharaoh. King, no disrespect, but this is God. They don't call him Yahweh in this text. I wish they would have, because that would have shown maybe some personal relationship with the magicians, maybe some conversion there with Yahweh. They use the word Elohim, reference to God. So maybe the gods did it. But nevertheless, they're saying, this is supernatural. This is beyond us. The gods are at work. This is not, we can't do this. 
I don't know if you knew this, but the Egyptians, the Egyptian magicians' daily ritual was to shave the hair all, on all of their body. And now that they are being bitten by bugs, eaten alive, they're not able to do so. So they probably got sores and bumps all over their body and they can't shave now. And now they are declared unclean by their own religion and spiritual laws. God was mocking these priests of Egypt. I will make you unclean. They for the first time declare to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. I, I want to hear that. And have, I want to see that replay. This is the finger of God. This is the first mention of the word finger in the Bible. First mention. Not one mention of it in Genesis. This is the only mention, this, or this is the first mention here in Exodus. And it is not in reference to a human being. It is in reference to God. By magicians in Egypt. I just love all of the pictures. Let's talk about this idea, the finger of God. Have you ever asked yourself that question in life? Is this the finger of God? One of the greatest pictures of this is in Daniel chapter 5. Let me read it to you. The story goes like this. Many years later, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for 1,000 of his nobles. This king throws a giant party in his palace for all of his leaders, and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver cups that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. Go get, go get the gold and silver cups from the temple of Yahweh. We're going to drink wine out of the precious treasure of Yahweh. He wanted to drink with his nobles, his political leaders, his wives, plural, and his prostitutes. So they brought these golden cups from the temple to the, from the house of God in Jerusalem and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them and while they drank from them they praised their gods made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. They had a giant party worshiping the other gods and suddenly, verse 5 says, they saw a finger of a human hand right on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. A hand appeared in the palace floating and wrote on the wall of the palace. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote and his face turned pale with fright. His knees started knocking together in fear and his legs gave beneath him. God wrote on the wall these words, Meanie, meanie, tekel me farsin. This means you have been weighed in the balance and found guilty. You're dead, dude. And he died that day. What will it take for you to lay down and declare this is the finger of God in your life and turn to the Lord? Have you seen the finger of God in your life? Does it take someone else telling you this is the finger of God? And it says Pharaoh just hardens his heart and he doesn't listen. Your wife telling you this is the finger of God? Your friend telling you this is the finger of God. What does it take to open your eyes to see the finger of God? Hebrews 3, 7 says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in rebellion in the days of testing in the wilderness where your fathers tested and tried me. And for 40 years, they saw my works. They saw the finger of God. God says, therefore, I was angry with that generation because they didn't recognize what I was doing. And I said, their hearts are going away astray and they have not known my ways. So I swore an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. And God did not let that generation enter the promised land with Moses, 
Moses didn't get in either. That entire generation was left out. Their kids got to go in. What pictures here? You will not enter rest. You will not enter rest until you see my work. I can never forget when Jesus in John 8 reached down with his finger and wrote the sins of the religious leaders in the sand. Do you remember? And he said, let he without sin cast the first stone after he'd written all of their sins in the sand. They got up and left one by one as he wrote their sins right there in front of them, in front of everybody. They're scared to death. And then I love the, the, the closer. Jesus says in John 8, 10, he stood up and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Did even one of them condemn you? And she said, no. And he says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Have you analyzed the story of your life to see where God's fingerprint was all over it? When I look back on life, I see major moments when God's finger showed up in my life. <clears throat> and I can declare it was the finger of God. <clears throat> I'll never forget in junior high when the girl I would stare at in Spanish class who was a part of the party crew. Como estas? had her friend, this, this cute girl, had her friend walk up to me. She's part of the party crew. I was not. I was a loser. I was over in the corner. I was a loner. And she had her friend walk up to me and ask me if I wanted to be her boyfriend. I couldn't believe it. I was scared to death. And I ran away. I never talked to her again. <laughs> the finger of God. He kept me from the party crew in junior high. I'm not joking. If I would have entered in, became, went down that, who knows what I, I would have done with those people. Gone down a very bad road with those kids. I remember when my mom died when I was young. Can't forget that. I didn't want it, but it changed our lives forever. I remember when my dad gave me my first Bible. Never forget it. Changed my life forever. I'll never forget when my dad gave me my first guitar to learn to worship, changed my life forever. I remember when my dad showed me great grace when I tried to run away from home, changed my life forever. I remember going across the street on my lunch break when I was working at Stater Brothers bagging groceries to hear Greg Laurie preach for the first time when I was, I was 16 years, 17 years old. Changed my life forever, changed the trajectory of my life. I remember seeing Katie in the second service balcony at church. Oh, yes. Weren't you supposed to be worshiping during that time? I was. I was. I promise. One email and one conversation moved me to look for a building in Studio City over all other places in L.A. One email, one conversation. Somebody said to me, it was actually the pastor of Reality L.A., Tim Chaddock. He said, have you ever thought of Studio City? There aren't very many churches in Studio City. I said, huh, where is that? I went and looked. The first day we showed up, we found this place. The finger of God is always at work. Do you see his fingerprints? One of our deacons, Ray Wang, is always journaling and documenting the finger of God in his life. He says God's finger, God's fingerprints are all over this. I love that. He says he's following the breadcrumbs of God to find the bread of life, the manna. Picking up breadcrumbs everywhere he goes, journaling them down. God is the dictator of destinies, Spurgeon said, and appoints both means and ends. He is the king of kings, ruling rulers and guiding counselors. Alike in the crash of battle and the hush of peace, in the desolation of pestilence and famine and in the joy of abounding harvest, he is Lord. Awesome. In the highs and the lows, he is Lord. The psalmist David writes in Psalm 8.3, when I look at the sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? God's finger is at work in our lives today. He's moving on the earth now. He's moving in L.A. He's moving in Studio City. He's moving in America. 
Are you paying attention? Charles Spurgeon said, even if you can't always trace God's hand, you can always trust his heart because we know he is good. You can trust him. Even if you can't figure out the blueprint perfectly, you can know that he is good and that he has a plan for you. Amen? I don't know what season you're in. If it's a lottery season, you've won big, or if you're in a dark season today, but I want you to know that God is here regardless, and his finger is working in your life, and he may be revealing some things to you today, and I want to ask you just to open your hands, open your heart to him, and say, God, help me. Save me. I'm going to pray for us that God would do that in our lives as we close. Let's pray. Father, we turn to you now, and we see your fingerprint all over our lives and all over our nation all over our city, our families, and our work. God, we pray that you would open our eyes to see more of it spiritually of what you're up to. And God, I pray for every person here today. Lord, you've brought us here today for this reason, for this time, for this moment, and we've talked about this topic. And so, Lord, I don't know what you're pointing out with your finger today. But I pray, Father, that we would look to the cross Remember that we've sinned and fall short of your glory and cry out to you as Savior and King over our lives. That we'd see you took the punishment so we could be forgiven. And that we would repent of all of our sin, turn away and turn to you with all of our hearts in this moment. We would open our hands to you and say, we trust you, God. We, don't, we may not be able to see exactly how this is going to work out, exactly what you're going to do, but we open our hands and say, that is the finger of God. We know you are up to something, and we choose to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved in our situation now. Please, God, work in us as we confess to you, as we seek you. We pray that we'd find you today. Help us in this season. Help us not to worship the gods of this world, but to turn to you with all of our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.